that have these or don't have grip at all. Oop. Psalm 56, verse 3 says this, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause, talking about his enemies. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? In wrath cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not written in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day that I call. This I know. God is for me. In God whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? What a great reminder of this God we serve and in who we are in Christ and the hope and security and joy we have in Him. We're here 
to worship that God this morning. We're so glad you are here to worship with us. If you are new, in the pew back in front of you, there should be a little brochure. Please grab that and take that home. Uh, we also, on the back of that, have a visitor's card. We would love for you to fill that out. Uh, and then as the offering plates come around here in a moment, uh, put that in there is all we would ask of you so we can get to know you, have a record of your visit. And, uh, and please, again, take that home with you and, and learn about uh, who we are as a church at Grace and how you can get in touch with us there if you need to. Let's go through our uh, announcements for the week. Um, remember the memory verse for the month, Philippians 2, 5 through 7. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or, or clung to, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. What a great reminder for us there. Our announcements, uh, again, a reminder, the uh, contribution records for last year are available in the church office if you need those for your tax returns. Today, right after the service, we have a uh, lunch for our staff appreciation. So this is for our non-elder staff. This church-wide potluck, so please come and join us in the gym right after this. Um, we are truly grateful for all the work and the service uh, that our staff do for us. And so Beth Wheeler does our finances. Uh, Christy Young does our children's ministry on, on Sunday mornings. Karen Swigert and Nita McCarter uh, do our facilities and cleaning there. And then uh, Keisha Murray does our um, office management, and then Will Peterson does our um, children's ministry on Wednesday nights, and so, and Zephram, who also does the youth as well. So uh, we want to thank them and their spouses, and so please join us for that lunch fellowship right after church today. There's also, you'll see, uh, there's a community group questionnaire that is due next Sunday, and so this is for all members and regular attenders. Even if you don't attend a community group, we would ask for you to Fill out this. If you don't attend, there's two questions to fill out, and then you're done. Um, there's a QR code. You can take a picture of that with your phone, and it will uh, then link you to that form. And that's just a way for me and for our community group leaders to see how our community groups are doing and what areas uh, of need we can focus on to improve those and make those more effective. Guys, if you sign up for our or the Ironman Summit at Owasso Bible Church, Please make sure that you also sign up on the form out here. We'll be leaving from Grace at 6.50. We'll have breakfast and lunch there at the Bible Church of Owasso, and then we will have dinner uh, in Tahlequah on the way back. If you didn't sign up for that, uh, sorry, they are sold out. So they are at capacity there at Bible Church of Owasso. Um, but again, just remember for our guys. Um, save the dates. Youth Winter Jam is going to be on March 1st. Uh, Resurrection Easter Sunday is on March 31st and then sports camp and volunteers. Um, one thing that's not in your uh, announcement there, uh, as elders, one thing we've been wanting to do better, we want to make sure everything in our worship service uh, is done for a specific purpose, and it's done to glorify God and to edify His saints. And so one thing we're going to focus on in the coming weeks is, is having more uh, specific times of prayer, uh, focused prayer in our worship service, and so here in just a moment, we're going to take up the offering, we'll sing one song, and then Joe is going to come back up, and he's going to give a missions moment, and we're going to pray specifically for uh, some missionaries, and so um, you can be looking forward to that. We'll have just more times of prayer throughout our service time. We're not going to go much longer or anything like that, so don't worry. We'll still have you out of here by lunch. Um, but I want to, as we go on and pray for the service right now, uh, we're going to read through uh, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to kind of use that to, to launch us into a time of prayer for the service right now. So here are the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Should be on the board there, or 7, starting 7. Uh, yes. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so uh, with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer right now and pray for our service. Father in heaven, uh, we do recognize that you are the sovereign God and ruler and creator of the universe, and you 
uh, reside outside of space and time and in unapproachable light, and yet still you are our Father, and we can come before you as your children redeemed by the blood of Christ. Lord, hallowed be your name. We ask that your name would be seen and regarded and viewed and spoken of and magnified as holy, as honorable, as worthy of our praise and our affection and our adoration. Lord, would your kingdom come? Would, would the, the, the actual reality that you are king of our lives, of this church, of the world to the ends of the earth, would that be displayed in the way that we think of you and pursue you and proclaim you and regard you and, and tell others about you in our neighborhoods and to the ends of the earth? Would your will be done? in our lives, that we as individuals, sons and daughters, would fight for holiness, to kill our sin, to take up our cross daily and follow you, to confess our sin, and to, to proclaim you to those around us. Lord, when your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven, would you give us this day our daily bread? We thank you for all the ways you provide for us, in ways that we can't even begin to recognize all of those. Would you give us an awareness of your presence, of your provision, your faithful love to us. Would we be thankful always for your provision to us? And would you lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil? God, you are our only hope. Lord, without you, we are sunk, we are lost in our sin, we are unable to live a life that pleases you. So, Father, this morning and as we leave this place, would you be magnified, Holy Spirit, would you move in our hearts and our minds and our lives, that our lives would be more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ because, Lord, you are worthy of the praise and you deserve all the praise that we can muster from our lives and these songs as we give of these tithes and offerings here in a moment. Would you be glorified? And we ask these things all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. If you are able, please stand together as we sing to our God, the mighty fortress who never fails.
Good morning, Grace. Uh, back on the wall, for those who have not noticed or do not know, there are a list of nine missionaries who we as a church uh, support. Uh, that support is from the church budget, and we vote on that, vote on those missionaries in October every year. And uh, that is uh, part of our budget that goes into there. But we also uh, understand that the many of the missionaries there often need uh, more support. And so we want to make sure that even though they're on the board and you can read them, that we bring them uh, to your attention as often as we can so that you can prayerfully decide if, if you as a family, as an individual, would like to support any of those missionaries. There's lots of missionaries all over the world and lots of ways to, uh, to support God's kingdom. But uh, these are eight that are familiar to us, and we want to make sure they're familiar to you. Uh, the ones we want to talk about today are Stephen and Paige Souter and Shepard and Olive. There they are. Olive is brand new. How old's Olive? Three, four, yeah, three or four weeks. Brand new. And uh, they are they're, they're members of our church, and they, we are the sending church for them to uh, go to uh, Utah. They went to a city in Provo uh, at a church, Mosaic Church. And they have since been sent out from there on a church plant to the city of Vineyard. And so to clear up any confusion, they, are not, they have not infiltrated the Vineyard Church. Many have come up and asked. They, are, they have not done that. They are in the city of Vineyard, and they are church planting. Again, there are gospel preaching churches, just a few in the entire Provo, hundreds of thousands of people, and just a few gospel churches. Okay? So it's a big deal there. We would not call the Mormon uh, population an unreached people group, but they are very confused and, uh, and demon-possessed church, not the people, the church. And so sending missionaries to the Mormon people is a big deal, and we are proud to send the suitors uh, there and church planting. And so that's what they are doing. And so uh, it is very difficult work. Uh, Stephen has a full-time job. And so the more support that they raise, the, the easier it is for them to spend more time investing into this new church. As you can see by the couple of pictures, uh, the new church plant is still quite large. They have a large gathering of young people. It is also mostly young people. Okay, so it's a very exciting opportunity. So uh, we want to give you the opportunity to know them. Uh, if you would like to support them individually, you can do, th do so through Grace Baptist Church. You go to Grace Baptist Church, there's a link for them, and that's how you can be a supporter of them. However, I have an opportunity for you, a special opportunity for the church that they would like us to know about. There is a citywide event happening at the end of May. I, I, maybe it's like the Red Fern Festival except on steroids. And so it's four or five days, and there's lots of opportunities to uh, be a part of the entire area. I think hundreds, up to 100,000 people. Okay? And so they really want to get their name out and to be a part of this event. In order to do so, you become a sponsor. And so sponsors raise, I think, anywhere from five hundred to two or three thousand dollars. So they're trying to raise separate money that they can then become a sponsor in this event. And the, the more of a sponsor you are, the more events that you are a part of. And so the more events you're a part of, the more their name of this new church gets out into the community. So they are hoping to get to the platinum level so they can be a part of all the events. So if it is on your heart that you would like to uh, support this endeavor, okay, which is a specific endeavor, then you can contact Stephen directly. So you can do that through getting a hold of any of the staff members. We will give you uh, Stephen's number directly. He asks that you would call him directly and that he will show you the, uh, how to do that. Okay? So uh, if you are interested in helping them be a part of this community-wide event uh, to get their brand new church out, uh, which, again, which is for the purpose of preaching the gospel, then uh, come see any of the staff members or elders, and we will give you Stephen's direct number, and you can do that. Uh, we now, most importantly, want to pray. Uh, for those, again, who do not know, the first Tuesday of every month, the Acts 1.18 gets together uh, and we pray. We had over, I think, around 
15 this month. So you just come and pray for our missionaries. That's what we do. We do have some business that we'll take care of, but everyone is invited. I would hope that one day we would have to meet in here and that the whole church comes and prays for our missionaries because that's what they covet the most. It's not just words. Yes, they need money. Yes, they need to be financially supported, but they covet your prayers more than anything else. And so uh, we want to honor them. So let's do that now. Let's go to the Lord and pray for the suitors. Oh. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we just, we just want to hallow, make sure that your name is hallowed and is above all names. Father, may our hearts be true to that truth, that your name is above all names. Father, you are your blessed son. He came not to be ministered to, but, but to minister. So we pray, pray for your blessing upon Paige and Stephen and both of those beautiful little children. As your servants may, that they may follow Jesus, that they may follow his footsteps, loving and serving their neighbors, and so many trapped into the wicked, false religion of Mormonism. Fill them with wisdom, patience, perseverance, humility, and courage. Enable them to share their gifts generously with those whom they meet. Give them an attentive mind and compassionate heart to see the face of Christ in all those whom they may encounter. Give your servants daily encouragement and ready will. Inspire them with your love and that they may worthily preach the gospel in your name in a spirit of reconciliation with God and with each and every one that they would meet. Father, we pray that you would keep the suitors in your hands and protect them from illness and injury and worry or anything that would distract them from the call that you have placed upon their life. All this, Father, we ask in, through him, the one who laid down his life, your son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we love you and we praise your name. Amen. This next song, When I Am Afraid, was uh, written by um, our former um, worship leader. And he wrote that song when he was diagnosed with cancer. And so he had that, that fear coming up. And it was just, When I Am Afraid, I Will Put My Trust in You. Um, and so we, as we look in the next section of scripture that's talking about end times and all of those things that are going on in wars, when we're afraid and we fear, we know who we can put our trust in. So if you are able to stand, let's stand together as we sing, When I Am Afraid. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you.
1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16 says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus, friend of sinners, loved me ere I knew him, drew me with his cords of love, tightly bound me to him, round my heart stood closely twined, the ties that none can sever. As we continue our time of worship, Ryan is going to be preaching in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 5 through 19. This is the word of the Lord. And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. And then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. 
There will be a great earthquakes in various places, famines and pestilences. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand on how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up, even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. God, we thank you, God, for your word. God, help us, Lord, as we um, continue our time of worship, God. Would you help Ryan, Lord, as he brings your word to us, Lord? Would you, God, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, God, your word as you speak to a people who, like us, Lord, are concerned with the future, Lord. But we know, Lord, that you have been faithful in the past. You're faithful in the present, Lord, and we can trust in you to be faithful with the future. So, God, would you help us, Lord, to have our hearts and our minds, God, ready, Lord, to listen, Lord, and then to apply your word in our lives. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Do you ever look at the world around us and feel like it's just kind of hopeless, like it's out of control? I mean, there's wars. We've got, you know, this conflict with Ukraine and Russia. We've got Hamas and Israel. There's, there's a looming threat of terrorism in our land. Our FBI is bringing out warnings constantly, uh, saying it's more dangerous now than before 9-11. If you turn on the news, you, you see hatred Greed, see corruption in our, our political system. And then just add to that all the natural disasters. I mean, we, we regularly hear of earthquakes and tsunamis and tornadoes and diseases, diseases, pestilences, and just the list goes on and on. And again, do you ever, do you ever look at all of that and just feel kind of hopeless, helpless? Or do you look at it and remind yourself this is actually what it's supposed to be like? That God has ordained this for us to bear witness to His reality. We should remind ourselves from the Word of God that He is in control. That this world, in fact, this world in its current state, it's not our home. We are citizens of another realm, another kingdom, and we are awaiting the return of our King in power and great glory. And the difficulties of this life, listen folks, they're not meant to scare us. They're not meant to distract us. Instead, I think part of what they should do is cause us to lean in more deeply to the Lord and gain His perspective on things that are, that are way outside of our control. And we're to bear witness to this world of His reality, of who He is. Folks, we, we are, are surrounded by people who are deceived today. There are people around us and they are lost and without hope. And we, the people of God, are the only ones on the planet who have the message of truth and hope. Now, thankfully, that doesn't mean just Little Grace Baptist Church here, not just our congregation, but it's all the true followers of Jesus Christ across this globe. But folks, He has placed you here right now for this time, for His glory in this time. The world is not spinning out of control. It is absolutely in His control. It's not in man's control. It's not at nature's control. The things that are happening around us are not random and chance. No. In fact, let me put up Psalm 115, verses 2 and 3. Why should the nation say, where is their God? 
Well, where's our God? Verse 3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. I could add to that Isaiah 40. Put it up here. Isaiah 40, verses 21 to 23. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is He who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. If you think about the, the rulers around us in this world, the leaders, political leaders, For the most part, they're in rebellion to the one true king. But here's the thing is God's not worried. Not even slightly. Well, how how does God respond to all of this? Let me put up Psalm chapter 2. Start with verses 1 through 3. The psalmist asks this, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against His anointing, saying, let us burst their bonds and and cast away their cords from us. Folks, that's the attitude of world leaders right now. We're not going to be chained by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We will not submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, His anointed King. In fact, Most of them don't believe in them at all. Don't believe in this God at all. Don't believe they should do this. So what's God's response to this attitude? Well, look at Psalm 2, verses 4 through 6. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Church, we we need to make sure that we have God's perspective on the current events of the world around us. And I think that's part of what we'll gain today in the text before us in Luke chapter 21. Jesus in this text was preparing His disciples for the time when He left, when He wouldn't be there with them, right before their eyes. And And remember that as he's saying these words, he is just a couple of days away from his death, and he knows it. The time has finally come for him to complete the mission for which he was sent to this earth. He's worked these three and a half years to prepare them for this. They still don't get it, but he has worked to prepare them. A lot of this will make sense to them after his death after His resurrection, after His ascension into heaven. At that point, the Holy Spirit will begin to bring to their minds, oh yeah, He said all this was going to happen, didn't He? In fact, He said these things must take place. And church, that's that's my hope this morning as we look at the words of Jesus, that, that we would gain God's perspective on the world events around us. And as difficulties arrive, and they're going to, they will see that this is part of God's plan. And that He has a purpose for us in them. And that purpose, I think, is this, that we would draw near to Him and that we would testify to who He is to this lost world. So that's, that's my hope as we're digging into this text together this morning. So let's take some time and receive the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. May He use them to conform our minds and our hearts and our lives to Him and to His will. Start again with verse 5. Verse 5, And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, He said, all right, we're going to stop there. So remember, remember where we are. Remember, I mentioned a moment ago a little bit, but this is, this is the end. This is Jesus has entered Jerusalem. This is the week coming into the Passover. Remember earlier in this week, he went to the temple and he cleared out all the money lenders and sellers, the vendors there. The temple was to be a house of prayer for the nations and they had turned it into a, a den of robbers and so he runs them off. Well, the religious leaders hated him before, but they really hate him now. 
And they have been trying to trick him into saying something that will, will get him to condemn himself. But Jesus has confounded their efforts time and time again. In fact, he's even turned the tables on them, telling them, listen, you all are the ones about to be forsaken by God. And now Jesus has shifted, and he's talking not to the people in general, he's talking to his disciples. And again, this is probably Wednesday before he is put to death on Friday. So that right there should make us realize the importance of these words. These are some of the last words that Jesus is going to say to his followers before he leaves. He's preparing them. And they are right here. They're in the temple area. This is the place to seek God. The place where the sacrifices for sin happen. And the disciples, they're looking around at their surroundings, at the magnificent splendor of this place with its lofty parapets and its grand colonnades. The, uh, the temple in the first century was one of the most beautiful buildings in the history of the world. Some of you have heard of a, a historian, a Jewish historian named Josephus. Well, I'm going to put up here what, how he described what the temple looked like. He wrote this, The whole of the outer works of the temple was in the highest degree worthy of admiration. For it was completely covered with gold plates, which, when the sun was shining on them, glittered so dazzlingly that they blinded the eyes of the holders, not less than when one gazed at the sun's rays themselves. And on the other sides, there was no gold. Where there was no gold, the blocks of marble were of such pure white that to strangers who had never previously seen them, from a distance they looked like a mountain of snow. Now, None of us have seen the temple because it's not there. And so through the years, people have tried to, to build models or artists have made renderings of this. So I want to show you just a little bit because I th we need this in our minds. It'll help the story make sense. But let's put up that first picture, Mark. This right here is the entire temple complex called Herod's Temple. This right here is the complex. Right here, that's the temple. All of this is part of Temple Mount. Okay, that temple itself, that is the part that's made with gold and marble. This right here, interestingly, is the Western Wall. Some of you have heard of that, haven't you? It's also called what today? The Wailing Wall. A little piece of that wall right here, the Western Wall, is the only thing left standing today from Herod's Grand Palace, our temple that was here in the first century. And notice, too, all these little things right here, these are people. All those little dots, those giant stairways. Here's the court of the Gentiles and so on. That should give you just a, a bit of an idea. All right, this is, a, this is a magnificent place. Now let's go to the next picture. Now if we zoomed into that temple right in the middle, that's what you would see here. Now again, this right here is the temple itself. This is some of the outer courts of it. Right here would be the court of women. Remember in our story from last week, the widow who went and put her coins in there? It would have been right there in that court of women. Out here was the court of Gentiles, the only place that a non-Jew could go. But if you were a Jewish person, you could enter into the court of women. And if you were a Jewish man, you could go beyond that into the next area, which would be the courts where the sacrifices take place, but only the Jewish men could go there. Let me give you one more picture of this. Here's an artist's rendering. So here we have, again, remember, this right here is the singular temple. All the rest on the outside is all the, the grand part of Herod's um, temple complex. But this right here is the temple. You can see sacrifices taking place down here. The people standing watching the priests doing all of their things. Now, with, with a little bit of that in mind, remember what Josephus described as he was describing this thing. The gold all of the adornments, the dazzling white marble. Literally, when the sun would rise, you couldn't look at the temple any more than you could stare at the sun. It was so amazing. Imagine how this temple complex, and the, and, and the temple itself, how breathtaking that must have been. But think about this too. The average person during this time lived in a house made of mud, brick, or stone. And then you come to this. And you're just, it's just jaw-dropping amazing. To go to the temple would leave one feeling 
overwhelmed with awe and joy and wonder and reverence. Let me put up Psalm 65, verse 4. Read this. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. Now, You've heard me call it Herod's temple, and that's because King Herod, who was not a Jew and was not a good man in any way, he offered to build this for the Jews because what he wanted was he wanted to have a crowning jewel in the center of his empire, and this was to be the place here in Jerusalem in the capital city to have this amazing temple right in the middle of it. The Jews eventually agreed with them, and this building project had been going on at this point in time when Jesus was in there for 46 years, and they continued to add to it until it eventually will get destroyed. And again, it didn't matter who you were, whether you were a king in a palace or you lived in a mud hut, everyone who went into this area just stood in awe. The brilliance, the size, the colors, the precision of the cut stones, the symbolism of the furnishings, the monetary value of this temple complex was just beyond calculation. So that helps us, I think, when we look at verse 5. And verse 5 says, while they're speaking of the, well, they're at the temple, they're speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. You're like, they're, they're just looking around going, look at this place. It's magnificent. All right, back to verse 6 in our text. And here's Jesus. Here's what he says to them as they're looking at all of this magnificence. As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Imagine you're standing in this massive edifice. How shocking that statement would have been to those people. This is the crowning jewel of Israel. Some of the the stones in the construction of this thing were more than 40 feet long. Some of these stones, just a single stone, would weigh over 100 tons. One stone. That's over 220,000 pounds. One stone. Precisely cut and set in place. And yet, here was Jesus saying that this amazing place would be completely annihilated. I'm thinking in their minds, they're like from the Princess Bride with Vicini. Inconceivable. This can't happen. How could, how could this take place? And yet we know from history it's exactly what did put, take place. In the year A.D. 70, about 40 years later, the Romans came, sacked Jerusalem, and they literally tore the temple down stone by stone. Gone. The only thing that is left today of the temple complex is that little piece of the western wall. In fact, I'm going to have Mark put up a picture. This is a picture of modern times. This right here, this little piece right there, that's it. These are all people. All these little white and black things you see down here, those are people. But that little section right there is all that is left, that entire massive complex of the temple complex of Herod. Notice too, though, So that's the western wall. What's up above the western wall in the place where the temple of Yahweh used to be? There's a Muslim mosque sitting there. I make note of this to say this. Jesus' words of unbelievable prophecy literally came true. Not one stone of that magnificent temple is there today. And we need to recognize too, why did this happen? What what was the cause for all this? What this was, was an act of divine judgment. God was punishing His people Israel for rejecting His Messiah, His chosen anointed King. But let me point this out also, because the destruction of the temple was also a gospel sign. The gospel of a a new salvation that God has provided in Jesus Christ. The old temple where the sacrifices of sin take place is no longer needed. No longer needed to deal with the sins between us and God. Now the only temple that matters is the temple of Jesus Christ himself. His body. His body which was pierced and then torn down from the cross and then raised from the grave. Giving eternal life to every Jew and every Gentile who trusts in him. So, 
it's interesting, as we look at the text, the, the Jews, and again, this must have been shocking, but they don't seem to reject it. What they're wondering is, when's this going to happen? It seems that they, they accept his testimony, it seems. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, And they asked him, Teacher, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? So here, here's Jesus' disciples, and they're receiving this mind-blowing prophecy of the destruction of this temple. And they're, they're, in their minds, they must have been thinking, this is the end times. This is right before the kingdom is established, and, 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 and this is it. This is the final judgment coming. And so, of course, you want to know when that's going to happen, right? I mean, who would not want to know if you could know the date of the end of the world? Just like, I want to know so I'm ready, so I can be prepared for this. Well, Jesus answers the the immediate question about the the destruction of the temple, but also the bigger question about the end of the world in his answer to them. As far as the temple, this destruction was not very far away, a little less than 40 years in the future. But that's still pretty close. Now, as we look at this chapter, we've got these prophecies, and it can be a confusing chapter. When I first started reading over this, and maybe you read ahead, and you're just like, what do we do with all of this stuff? What you have with a lot of prophecy is you have near and far fulfillments. You have prophecies that have a double focus. And that's how biblical prophecy usually works. There are near fulfillments that happen right away in the time and the life of the, uh, those who prophesy it, and you've got farther fulfillments that take place later. But to understand the far fulfillments, we've got to see the, the near ones. So think here in the immediate context. This is the time leading up to the fall of Jerusalem. And so Jesus, when he's telling his disciples this, this is right in their lifetime. This is all going to happen to you. You're going to see this take place. Be ready. At the same time, folks, the truth of the coming future judgment That's also in view in this chapter. So Jesus is equipping those disciples right then, but this is also equipping for us because the end is still yet to come. We're waiting for the fulfillment of all of these things in this chapter to take place in their finality when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So what I want to do now is in the rest of this section we're going to look at, Jesus gives the disciples four exhortations, four exhortations, and these are this, they're they're this, don't be led astray, don't be afraid, seize your opportunities to witness, and keep on keeping on. Okay, so the first one, let's look at the first one in verse 8. First exhortation is, do not be led astray. Look at verse 8 again. And he said, see that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. I would imagine if we spent some time, we could come up with a lot of false messiahs that we've heard throughout history who have come up saying, I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah, and people would follow them and be deceived. There have been countless of those. There have been also countless numbers of people who have tried to pinpoint when the end of times is going to come. Prophecy conferences still happen today, going, and they'll tell you, we're, we're living in those times, right? We can see this. We, we, we're seeing what's happening now in Israel with Hamas and all of these things, and, and this is the end times. Well, it's got to be Russia and China, right? These fit these prophecies. Let me ask you to think about it this way with me. Do you think anyone on planet Earth will not recognize it when Jesus Christ returns? There's no way. When Jesus came the first time, he came in obscurity. When he returns, it's going to be in blazing glory, blinding power of God. There is going to be no mistaking the return of Jesus Christ. In fact, he briefly describes it later in chapter 21. I'll put it up here, Luke 21, 27. He says this, And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And the cloud there isn't just like a cloud in the sky. This is the Shekinah glory cloud, like settled on the temple in the Old Testament times and around the tabernacle. Jesus had also mentioned his return earlier in Luke chapter 17. Let me put it up here. Luke 17, 22 to 24, we read this. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, hey, look, look there, look here. 
do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. You think anybody is going to mistake the return of Jesus Christ? No way. And throughout the years, people have, have tried to predict when this day is going to be. And there's always going to be some fringe religious group that will try to set their date for the end of the world. And here's the thing, folks. They've all been wrong so far. And I'm convinced from Scripture they're always all going to be wrong. It's going to happen when it's going to happen. And Jesus knew it would be like this. So he's warning his disciples. He knew that people would, would be coming up with strange ideas about the end of the world and, and false messiahs that would lead people away from the truth. And his words hold true to us today, just like they did in the first century. Don't get sucked into it. Don't be led astray. That's the first exhortation. But let's keep going. Look at verse 9. The second exhortation is this. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Verse 9. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. For these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. When we think about the end times and all of the, the terrible things that take place, it is only natural that those things can cause fear, right? The things that will happen at the end of the world, they're terrifying. They're especially, and should be especially terrifying for an unbeliever who will be absorbing the wrath of God. So obviously you, you can see there, where their question's coming from. <laughs> Jesus, when's this going to happen? Is there some kind of sign we can know so we're, we're ready for this? And, but notice Jesus doesn't give a specific answer in the text. And I think what we need to draw from that is this. If God wanted us to know the exact date of the end times, he would have told us. Instead, Jesus pointed out that many terrible things are going to happen before. They must take place first. It wouldn't happen all at once. Even the destruction of the temple wouldn't be the end of the world. It's as if Jesus said... You're going to look around. You're going to see all kinds of scary things. You're going to see wars. You're going to see riots, violent disorder. Don't be afraid. Don't get scared. This is God's plan. When we look around us and we see these very things today, we need to recognize the world is not out of control. We also need to recognize God's promises have not failed. In fact, that these things are taking place should remind us that Jesus' words are absolutely true. So don't be afraid. Why? Why should we not be afraid? Because he has you. And he has this world. In the next couple of verses, Jesus goes on to describe some other signs and other things that would take place before the, the final coming judgment. Look at verses 10 and 11. Verse 10, then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. One of the things that's interesting to me, at least, is that all of those things took place before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Every one of those things is a historical fact before even that took place. There was a Jewish insurrection against Rome that started in AD 66 and lasted until AD 70 when Rome is sacked or when uh, Jerusalem is sacked and the temple is destroyed. There were great earthquakes during that time. There was a powerful tremor in Phrygia in AD 61. There was another powerful earthquake in Pompeii in AD 62. There were famines that took place during these intervening years, both under Claudius and then again under Nero. There were even great signs in the heavens. Josephus writes about a comet that went across the sky. They didn't know what it was, but this light and this fire that went across the sky. We know today it was actually Halley's Comet. So that's what we would call it today. But all of those things took place, as Jesus said, before the temple was destroyed. 
And all of those things are signs not only to the destruction of the temple, but to the coming judgment on all mankind. Jerusalem wasn't destroyed until all those things took place. At the same time, folks, we're in the same situation. Because don't we see all that around us? We see nation rising against nation. We hear of earthquakes and tsunamis and natural disasters. We hear of famines all throughout the world and terrors of all various kinds. And Jesus' words remind us the end of the world has not yet happened and it can be frightening. Let me, let me, let me ask you, what, what do you fear? I want you to think about the future this year, the coming decades. What, what fears do you have? Here in Oklahoma, a lot of people get fearful of tornadoes, right? Depends on where you're living. But throughout the United States right now, there is... Again, the, the, the looming possibility of terrorist attacks with unregulated border crossings. We might be fearful of the, the next financial depression. Is it going to happen here in the next few years, months, weeks? And it's so easy to feel anxious about so many things. We could be anxious about all the events around the world right now that, that seem like we, we're on the verge of a global war. Okay, here, and here's Jesus. He's speaking to his disciples. I think he's talking to us right now in our place. And he's saying, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. <laughs> How? <laughs> How can we see all of that and have all of that looming and not fear? And I think the answer is because we serve the living Savior and king. And he has demonstrated his power over sin and death by rising from the grave. We serve the king of kings who has ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father who rules over the universe for his glory and according to his purposes. And this great king has sent to us his Holy Spirit to be with us in every dark place and for every terrible hour that we can face. So whatever disaster may come, the truth is God is with us. And Jesus says, do not be afraid. Well, and that leads us to another thing that could cause us to fear. In the next verses, we could be persecuted. And that's also where the third exhortation that Jesus gives comes out. Third exhortation is this, seize your opportunity to witness. Let's look at verses 12 to 15. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. Okay, think with me a moment. Were any of the early disciples or apostles persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ? Yeah, of the original 12, one betrayed him, but let's add Paul then to that number. How many of the 12 died for their faith? 11. And John ended up exiled in Patmos. Okay. We could go through the book of Acts and find arrests and intimidation and threats and beatings and imprisonment. They're taken before religious leaders, before governors, before even kings. And notice again what Jesus said about all this in verse 13. He said, all of that will be your opportunity to bear witness. The word opportunity means the result of, or this will lead to this. And let me ask you this. Do you remember what the Greek word is for witness? Our English, we say witness, bear witness, but what is the Greek word? Marturion, where we get the modern word martyr. Marturion. A marturion, to bear witness, means just that. It means to, to give direct knowledge about a person or event, to give your testimony. To, to the, it's the content of what a witness tells. So if you get a, think of somebody in a court of law, they're a witness and they're giving witness. They're giving that testimony. They're telling what they saw, what they heard. 
To be a witness for Jesus Christ became synonymous with being martyred, with dying for the name of Jesus. But what Jesus was telling his disciples was that their being persecuted will have the opposite effect of what the enemies of Jesus intend. They're trying to stamp out the the faith of Jesus Christ. Far from destroying the Christian faith, what we have seen through the years is that persecution has helped spread the gospel by giving God's people opportunity to give testimony to Jesus before all kinds of audiences. Over the century, persecution has has given opportunities to proclaim the gospel. It has purified the church and has demonstrated the triumph of the saving faith that we have in Jesus Christ. We could come up with, I imagine if we spent some time, we could come up with a lot of examples that would prove Jesus' words to be true here. His apostles and countless thousands after them were brought before authorities for the sake of the name of Jesus They were persecuted, they were ridiculed, they were marginalized, they were beaten, they were imprisoned, and some were even put to death for faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We could think of Polycarp, maybe that's one of the ones, that's one of my, he's one of my heroes, one of my favorites. Polycarp was a second century pastor in Smyrna, which is in Turkey, and he was, he was tied to the stake, brought before the proconsul, and he is commanded to deny Jesus Christ commanded to recant. Some of you might remember his reply. I love it. Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has never done me one wrong. How can I now blaspheme my king and my savior? Or maybe you think of the Czech reformer, John Huss. As he was about to be burned at the stake, here's what he proclaimed. The Lord Jesus Christ, my Redeemer, was bound with a harder chain, and I, a miserable sinner, am not afraid to bear this one, bound as I am for his namesake. And for the same truth of the gospel for which I have written and taught and preached, drawing upon the sayings and positions of the holy doctors, I am ready to die today. And he did. Or we might think of the example of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was forced to stand before the emperor and before the general assembly of the Holy Roman Empire. And here's what he said. He looked at those men. He said, since then, your serene majesty and your lordships seek a simple answer. I will give it in this manner, neither horned nor toothed. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the pope or in the councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. Now, he wasn't killed at that time, as others were. But take all of that, and and let's go back to Luke. Jesus was letting us know, his disciples know, that they would be persecuted for his name. The enemies of Jesus hate Jesus. You know what? They can't get a hold of him, so what do they do? They get a hold of his followers, his disciples. They lash out at us, in his place. But the beauty of this is that the more opposition the church suffers, the better our opportunities are, and the more the Holy Spirit will help us. And even if we don't know exactly the right thing to say, you might look back and go, I I don't know how to answer like Peter did when he's facing this, or Paul, how, how do I know how to say? Even if you don't know exactly the right thing to say, the Holy Spirit will take what you have and use it for His glory, for the glory of God. So church, let us not fail to take advantage of the opportunities we have for witness, either because we're afraid of what they might do to us or because we're afraid of making a mistake. Yet you need to know the gospel. You should know the gospel. The gospel's simple. 
The simple outline of God, Christ, God, man, Christ's response. You know, simple out, there's simple outlines you can follow, but the gospel is this amazing truth of what God has done in sending his son Jesus to die on the cross and to rise from the dead so that sinners like us can be forgiven, not based on anything we have done, but upon, upon his work alone. That's the gospel. You don't need anything more than that, but you need that. Yes, know the gospel, know how to share it, but don't worry about what to say. Just simply do this. Just simply give God something he can use. Speak. How can they know the Lord unless someone gives them the gospel? Romans 10 makes it really clear. Speak, and God will use it for his glory. Seize your opportunities to bear witness. So that was the third exhortation. Seize those opportunities. Fourth exhortation we see is this. Keep on keeping on. Look at verses 16 to 19. Keep on keeping on. Verse 16. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. Okay. Think about what Jesus has predicted in these verses we just looked at. There's going to be deceivers. There's going to be disasters. There's going to be persecutions of every form. And some will even be put to death for the name of Jesus. And you you hear that. I imagine the first century disciples hearing that. They think, how in the world can Christianity continue? And how can we believe Jesus when he says not a hair of our head's going to perish? Or that we're going to gain our lives how does that fit when he says they're going to kill some of you? Some of you, they're, they're going to do all this persecution to you, and some of you, they're even going to kill. How does that fit with not a hair of your head perishing and endurance keeping your life? And the simple answer is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Ever lasting life. Here's the truth is they can kill your body, but they can't touch you. They can't kill you. If you're trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have already passed out of death into life, and the wrath of God has been forever removed from you. Let me put up Matthew 10, 28. Listen to what Jesus said here. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And I think what Jesus is saying in our our text here is keep on keeping on because not a hair of your head can perish. You keep enduring unto life. Why? Because he's got you. In fact, look at the words in uh, John 10. Let me put up here John 10, 27 to 29. Jesus said this, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Jesus makes it so clear The reason that we endure is because He has us. He has us. You will persevere. You'll keep on keeping on. You'll endure because He has you. And the life that He's given you is eternal and no one can touch it. Let me put up here kind of a summary of this. We're talking about the idea that our salvation will never go away. This is the Westminster Confession on this topic. Western Mr. Confession says this, They whom God has accepted in the Beloved, effectually called and sanctified by His Spirit. All right, let's stop there for a second. I know you hear those words, and unless you're kind of theologically trained or studied, you may not recognize what all those are. They whom God has accepted in His Beloved. That's those whom God has accepted because they're in Jesus Christ, His Beloved Son. Those who are effectually called, those that God has called out of darkness into His light. You're no longer in the darkness, you're now in His light. Those who have been sanctified by His Spirit, that is, you've been made holy. The Holy Spirit has has crucified you with Christ, and the life of Christ has been given to you. What about them? 
They can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. Church, if God is for us, who can be against us? Jesus makes it so clear in his his words that his people will not be lost. Not a hair of our head will perish. And Jesus wasn't the only one that affirmed that truth. The apostles clearly demonstrate it. Think of Philippians 1.6. What does that say? I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He began it. He completes it. You're his. Or take Philippians, I'll put this one up here. Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, <clears throat> so now, not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. All right, how are you going to do that? How are you going to work out your salvation, live out this salvation? Well, verse 13 tells you, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Keep on keeping on because he has you. Your salvation is permanent, unfailing, and undying. Now, some people at this point think, but what do we do with people who have fallen away? What do we do about it? We, all of us in here could probably think of folks that we know, maybe people very close to us, who once professed a Savior, who were once in the church singing worship songs with us, and today they deny him. What do we do with that? Well, here's the truth is there always have been and there always will be false believers. In fact, the way the Apostle John characterizes them, the people who appear to have lost their salvation, that that they never truly possessed it. They never had saving faith. Let me put up 1 John 2.19. John writes this, They went out from us, But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. Jesus' promise is this. That those who continue to hold on to him, that not a hair of their head will perish. And remember, he's just promised that some of his disciples will die. So it can't mean that this is a guarantee of your physical protection, of absolute promise that you'll be physically protected. His point in saying this was that though they may die physically, his true children will never perish eternally. They cannot be touched in that way. They have and they always will have eternal life. It's theirs. Jesus was pointing out that those who trust in Christ will endure to the end so that they will not fall away, that they will demonstrate their faith was truly an authentic gift of God. All of his children have eternal life and will receive the final aspect of salvation. They will live forever with him in his glory and joy. So brothers and sisters, from what our Lord Jesus has told us, do not be led astray. Don't live in fear, but make sure you seize your opportunities to be a witness for Jesus, and then keep on keeping on after him. As Jesus said in John 6, he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said that You have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. I love this last part. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Let's pray. God, thank you for that assurance. That we did not um, initiate and start our faith and we won't lose it because it's all of you. It's your grace, your amazing grace that calls us into life. Lord God, I have to admit 
for myself and on behalf of so many in this room, we struggle with these things. We struggle with, with getting our eyes on, on the, the, the scary things around us, we, on the, the wars and the tumults and the riots and, and disasters. And, and, and it's so easy to become fearful. Lord, would you help us to be a people who, who trust in you, who see the truth that you are powerfully, sovereignly in control of all things. And these things must take place. And they are opportunities for us to be bold and loving in our witness. Father, we are surrounded by people. We go to work with people. We live in neighborhoods with people who are lost and deceived and will face your wrath unless the gospel of Jesus Christ penetrates their heart and you save them. So would you help us to be lovingly bold witnesses for your son? Would you help us them even to see us not being afraid because we're trusting in our great king and we know these things must take place and that you are the sovereign one in control. And so why should we fear? Our citizenship is in heaven and we await our Savior. And the king will come in his time and for his glory. And we will be rescued. And all rebellion will end. Oh, we pray with so many before us, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus and help us to cling to you now. And help us to proclaim you now. Thank you that you have us. Help us Lord to keep going after you. We love you Lord. We pray come quickly Jesus and in your name I pray. Amen. Folks, two of our elders are in the back, Bill and Jason, and they would love a chance to pray with you. You know, what we, what we talked about today is, is centered around the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news is that, well, it starts with bad news. So we have sinned. Who in here has told the most lies? If your hand's not going up, you're doing it right now. You're lying. How many lies have you told in your life? What does Revelation 21, 8 say? All liars will have their part in a lake of fire. There's not a person in this room, there's not a person in this room who is not a sinner. You need the forgiveness that is only found in Jesus Christ. He died the death you deserve and he rose so that you can be forgiven. You don't earn it, you don't work for it, you don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Bill and, and Jason, I think Susan's back there as well, would love to talk to you about your relationship with the Lord. Or maybe you're struggling with fears. Or maybe you're battling an illness. You just need prayer. They're back there for that as well. So take advantage of the opportunity so the elders, the pastors of this church can serve you. Let's uh, sing a couple songs as we come to a close. If you're able to stand together. <clears throat> Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made? creation groaning is a new creation coming is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves of this
Bless on toward the blessed shore. Oh, praise the Lord, we're almost home. Amen. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. You all are invited to a meal right now in honor of uh, thanking our, our folks who serve at this church in some physical ways, in different ways. Uh, I'm going to pray right now for the meal. As soon as you get there, please go right on into the line and get your food and head on to your seat. If you have food that you haven't put over there yet, then rush over quick and get it set. Um, but the main course is there and the sides are on the table. So let me pray for us and we'll head on over and uh, enjoy a meal together as a family. Oh, God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for this, this family. May we, may we eat and drink to the glory of our great King, our Father, the Lord God Almighty, to you, God. Uh, thank you for this food. Thank you for the hands that are prepared. Thank you for Ronnie and the Corns and the work they have done to prepare the main dish and for folks who have fried the others. Well, Lord, all those gifts are from you, and so we, we truly acknowledge them and thank you for them. Help us to... Um, to be blessed by this food, but then to be a blessing to those around us. May you use us for your glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You are sent.